Hello everyone and welcome to Simply Code's YouTube channel. I hope you guys are doing well. Today, we'll be taking you through one of the most important libraries of Python, the Pandas. Think of Pandas as a superhero that helps you perform super fast data analysis. It's a tool that's used by data scientists and analysts all over the world. And it's a key component of data science ecosystem in Python. Our trainer Richard will take you through the concept of Pandas in Python but before we begin, let me tell you guys that we have regular updates on multiple programming videos. So if you are a programmer and if you want to learn something new, then consider getting subscribed to our YouTube channel and press that bell icon to never miss any updates from Simply Code. So without any further delay, let's hand over this session to Richard. Pandas really is a core Python module you need for doing data science and data processing. There's so many other modules that come off of it. There actually sits kind of on NumPy. So if you've already had our NumPy array, hopefully you've already gone through the NumPy tutorial one and two. So today we're going to cover what is pandas. We'll discuss series. We'll discuss basic operations on series. And then we'll get into a data frame itself, basic operations on the data frame, file related operations on a data frame, visualization, and then some practice examples. Roll up our sleeves and get some coding underneath there. And let's start with just some real general, what is Pandas? Pandas is a tool for data processing, which helps in data analysis. It provides functions and methods to efficiently manipulate large data sets. Now, this is a step down from, say, using Spark or Hadoop in big data. So we're not talking about big data here, but we are talking about Pandas. And there is some connections. There's like an interface going on with that, so there is availability. But you really should know your Pandas, because if you're working in big data, you'll know there's data frames. Well, Pandas is a data frame primarily. It has a couple different pieces we'll look at here. And if you've never worked with data frames before, a data frame is basically like an Excel spreadsheet. You have rows and columns. You can access your data either by the row or the column. I and mean, you have an index and different, that kind of setup. And we'll dig more into that as we get deeper into Pandas. But think of it as like a giant Excel spreadsheet that's optimized to run on larger data on your computer. And then I said it, that it's a data frame. So the data structures in Pandas are series, one-dimensional arrays. And then we have data frame, two-dimensional array. And it really centers around the data frame. The series just happens to be part of that data frame. And here's a closer look at a pandas series. Series is a one-dimensional array with labels. It can contain any data type, including integers, strings, floats, Python objects, and more. So it's very diverse. If you remember from NumPy we studied, they had to be all uniform. Not in pandas. In pandas, we can do a lot more. And pandas actually kind of sits on NumPy, so you really need to know both of those if you haven't done the NumPy tutorials. And you can see here we have our index 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then our data A, B, C, D, and E. Very straightforward. It's just two columns, and we have a nice index label and a column label for the data. And then a data frame is a two-dimensional data structure with labels. We can use labels to locate data. And you can see here we had, if we go back one, we had our index, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So in each one of these series, they would share the same index over there, the row index. So you have your row index, df.index, and then you have a column index, df.columns. And this would look, like I said, this would be really familiar if you've done any work with spreadsheets, Excel. So it kind of resembles that. This does make it a lot easier to manipulate data and add columns, delete columns, move them around. Same thing with the rows. So you have a lot of control over all of this. Now, we're, of course, going to do this in our Jupyter Notebook. You can use any of your Python editors, but I highly suggest if you haven't installed Jupyter and haven't worked with it, it is probably one of the best ways for easily displaying a project you're working on. I skip between a lot of different user interfaces or IDEs for editing my Python, and it's just simply jupyter.org, J-U-P-Y-T-E-R.org, and then I always let mine sit on Anaconda, anaconda.com, and just real quick, we'll open that up for you. Oops, offline mode. Don't show me that again. But you can see here that I have different tools that I can actually install in my um, Anaconda, including the Jupyter Notebook, which comes by default. And then I have access to the environments. And again, that's uh, anaconda.com, named after the very large, one of the largest, world's largest snakes, and then Jupyter Notebook. In this case, jupyter.org. And when we're in our I'm going to go in here to our Jupyter Notebook, and we're going to go ahead and just do new and a Python 3. 
and this will open up a Python 3 untitled folder. So diving right in, let's go ahead and give this a title, Pandas Tutorial. And we'll go up to cell and we'll change the cell type to markdown so it doesn't execute it as actual code. One of those wonderful tools when you have Jupyter Notebooks, you can do demos with this. And let's go ahead and import pandas. And usually people just call it PD. That has become such a standard in the industry. So we'll go ahead and run that. Now we have our pandas has been imported into our Jupyter Notebook. And then oh, we can go ahead and let me do the control plus. Since it's Internet Explorer, I can enlarge it very easily so you have a nice pretty view. Oops, too big. There we go. And whenever you're working with a new module, it's good to check your uh, version of the module. In pandas, you just use the, in this case, pd dot underscore underscore version underscore underscore. That's actually pretty common in most of our Python modules. There's different ways to look up the version, but that's one of the more common ones. And we'll go ahead and run that. We get 0 0.23, 0 0.4. And if we go to the Pandas site, we see 0.23.4 is the latest release. And of course, a reminder that if you're going to your environment, you need to install it. So you'll need to do pip install pandas if you're using the pip installer. We'll go ahead and close out of that. And the first thing we want to do is we're going to work with series. A lot of the stuff you do in series, you can then do on the whole data set. We need to do what? Create one. We need to manipulate it. Take pieces of it. So query it. Query it, delete, so you can delete different parts of it. So we want to do all those things with the series. And we'll start with the series and then almost all the code, in fact, all the code does transfer right into the actual data table. So we go from a series of a single list of one column, and then we'll take that and we'll transfer that over to the whole table. And we'll start by creating, oh, let's put a, there we go, creating a series from list. And let's just call this ARR equals, and we'll do 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. If you remember from our last one, we could easily do R equals range of 5, which would be 0 to 4. But we'll do R equals 0 to 4, and we'll call this S1, and we'll go PD, and series is capitalized. This one always throws me, is which letters do you capitalize on these modules? They're getting more and more uniform, but you got to watch that with Python. And we're just going to go ahead and do ARR. So we're just going to take this Python list, and we're going to turn it into a series. And then because we're in Jupyter, we don't have to put the print statement. We can just put S1, and it'll print out this series for us. And let's go ahead and run that and take a look. And you'll see we have two rows of numbers. So the first one is the index. Now it automatically creates the index starting with zero unless you tell it to do differently. So we get zero, index row zero is zero, one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four. And because it's a series, it doesn't need a title for the column. There's only one column, so why title it? And this also lets you know that it's a data type of integer 64. So we print this out. This is our series, our basic series we've just created. And let's do a second series. PD, and we'll use the same data list, and let's go ahead and do order. We'll give it an order equals, oh, let's do it this way. Let's go index equals order, and it helps if we actually give it an order. So we'll do order equals, and let's do one, two, three, four, five. So instead of starting with zero, we're going to give it an order starting with one. We're going to run that. And we'll go ahead and print it out down here, S2. And we'll see that we now have an index of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And that represents 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 in the series. And we're still data type integer 64. And very common, as you're missing with NumPy arrays, is we can import our NumPy as NP. Remember that from our NumPy tutorials. We can go ahead and create a NumPy out of random with the random numbers of 5. And let's just see what that uh, n looks like, so we can see what our numpy looks like. So we have some nice random float values here, 2.33, so on. And that's from our last tutorial, the numpy tutorial 1 and 2. And instead of calling it order, let's call it index. And we're going to set our index equal to a, b, c, d, and e. I want to show you that the index doesn't have to be an integer, so it can be something very different here. And then let's go ahead and create our, we'll just use s2 again. And here's our np for numpy. Series, capital S, and N is our NP for numpy. PD for pandas. There we go. Switching my anachronisms. 
So we have pd.series of n, and we're going to do our index equals our index we just created. And then let's go ahead and see what that looks like. S2 is a print it, and let's run that. And we can see here we have a nice series going on. A, B, C, D, and E for our indexes. So instead of it being 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, we can make this index whatever we want. And you can see the numbers here going down that we randomly generated from the NumPy array. So we use NumPy to create our Panda series right here. And so continuing on with creating our series, this one I use so often, we create a series from a dictionary. So we have our dictionary. In this case, we went ahead and did A of 1, B is 2, C of 3, D4, E of 5. So each one of those is a key and then a value. And then we're going to use, oh, let's use S3 equals PD for pandas, series. And then we want to go ahead and just do D in here. Print out S3 here. And let's go ahead and run this. And you can see we got A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, D is 4, E is 5. And it's still of integer 64 because the actual data is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it's all integer 64, type 64. And the last thing we want to do in the creating section of our series is to go ahead and modify the index. Because we're going to start modifying all this data. So let's start with modifying the index of the series. And if you remember, let's do a print this time, S1. I'll go ahead and run this. And the reason I did print is because it only prints out the last variable. So if I put S1 up here and we're going to do another variable back down lower, it won't print the first one, just the last one. And we're going to go ahead and take S1, the index, and we're just going to set it equal to a new index. And obviously, the number of objects in our index has to equal the number of objects in our data. And then because it's the last variable, we can go ahead and just do an S1. And let's run that. And you can see how we went from 0 to 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 as our index. We've now altered it to A, B, C, D, and E. So this would be much more readable or might be representational of a larger database you're working with. So cool tools. We've covered creating a database based on our basic array, Python array. We've showed you how to do, uh, reset the index. Then we showed you how to use a numpy array. So you can put a numpy array in there. It's all the same. You know, pd.series, a numpy array, and then we can set the index on there. And the same thing with the dictionary. So it's very versatile how it pulls in data. And you can pull in data from different sources and different setups and create a new series very easily in the pandas. And then we looked on changing your index. So now we have a new index on here. And then we want to go ahead and do some selection. Let's do some basic slicing most common thing you'll probably do on here and we'll just do s1 this notation should start to look really familiar again this is going to put an output so i'd usually it doesn't change s1 this just selects it so we might do a equals s1 and then print a and you'll see that it just looks at the first three zero one two and we can do the same thing by not having the a in there i'll go ahead and take that out but it's just a reminder that it's not actually changing s1 it's just viewing S1. So a simple slicing on here. And we can likewise do an append. Oops, before we do append, let's just do a quick kind of fun one. We'll do to minus 1. And you'll see it covers everything but the E. Of course, you can do minus 2 on this side. So one another way to select it is to go how far from the end. And likewise, we can do a 2 here. A CDE to the end. So it starts at the second one. And another way we can do this is we can do a minus 2 over here. And that looks at just the last two in the slice. So you can see how easy it is to slice the data. And of course, there's no reason to do this, but you could select all of them <laughs> if you wanted to view all of them on there. Oops, 32. There's not 32, so it's just going to show the first three. There we go. And then we can also append. So I can take and, oh, let's create another uh, series and append one to it. And if you remember, we had S3. There's our S3. And we have our S1. I'll go ahead and do S1. And let's go ahead and do, oh, let's call it S4 equals S1 append S3. So we're just going to combine those two into S4. And if we go ahead and print S4 on here, you'll now see that we have A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, because we started the data at 1. So very easy to append one series to the next. And if we're going to append one series to the next, we need to go ahead and drop or delete one. And drop is a keyword for that. 
and let's just do E, or index E. And so if I run this, you'll see that it'll print it out, and A, B, C, D, there's no E. And remember, all these changes, if I type in S4 again, you'll see that S4 still has E in it. So this change does not affect the series unless you tell it to. So I'd have to do like X, S4 equals S4.dropE. And there's another way to do that, which we'll show you later on. Let me just cut this one out. There we go. All right, so we've covered all kinds of cool tools here. We have appending, we have slicing, we did all the creating stuff earlier. So you can see here on the setup how easy it is to manipulate the series. So next, what we want to get into is we want to get into operations that happen on the series. Let me go ahead and change this cell to markdown. There we go. And run that. So series operations. What can we do with the series? And let's start by creating a couple arrays. We'll call it array 1, and we'll do 0 through 7. And array 2, 6 through 6, 7, 8, 9, 5. I don't know why I threw the 5 on the end. <laughs> let's go ahead and run those so those load up into Jupyter. And uh, we'll do this a little backwards. We're going to do S5 equals a panda series of array 2. So I'm doing this in reverse. And then when we do S5, you'll see that we have 0 to 4. It automatically assigned the index. 6, 7, 8, 9, 5 for our series. And let's go ahead and do the same. And we'll call this S6. And we'll set this equal to PD series for our first array. And if we do an S6 down here to print it out, we'll see something similar. I got 0 through 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7 for the data. So those are two series we just created, series 6, 5, and 6. And one of the first things we can do is we can add one series to the next. So I can do S5.add S6. And let's see what that generates. And just a quick thing, if you've never used Pandas, what do you think is going to happen with the fact that this only has five different values in it, and this one has seven values. So let's see what that does. And we end up with 6, 8, 10, 12, 9, and it goes, oh, I can't add this. There's nothing there. So it gives us a null return. Very different than the numpy that would have given you an error. This instead tells you there's no value here because we couldn't generate one. So we can easily add s5.add s6. And likewise, we can do s5.sub for subtract, s6, and we'll run that. And on the add, the subtract, and you guessed it, we're going to do multiply and divide next. Again, you can see there's the null values where it can't subtract the two because there's no values there to subtract. We can also do s5 multiply, m-u-l. They're all three letters on these. That's one of the ways to remember how they figured out the code for this. So remember, these are all three letters, mul. We'll go ahead and run this, and you can, again, you can see how they're multiplied together. And then we can also do the S5 div, three letters again, S6, and run that. And you'll see here, this goes to infinity because we have zero in the wrong position. So it actually gives you a whole different answer here. That's important to notice. And then in the null values, because there's no data, and it can't actually produce an answer off of, null, of, off of missing data. And since we're in data science... Let's do S6 median. So let's look up the median data, which is simply uh, median. Sorry for those who are following the three letters, because median is not three letters. And you can see an S6 is 3.0. And let's do a print here. And we'll do median or average. S6. And let's print max, comma, S6. And just like median, there's max value. And if we're going to have a max value, we should also have a minimum value. So let's pop in minimum. We'll go ahead and run this. And you're starting to see something that would be generated like, say, an R, where you're starting to get your different statistics. We have a median value of 3, max value of 7, and a minimum value of 0. And what it does when it hits these null values, if there is null values in there, because we could still do that, we could actually, uh, you know what, let's go up here and do... Let's pick this one where we multiplied. Let's go S7 equals. I'll go ahead and print the S7 just so I keep it nice and uniform. So I still have my S7 down there and run it. And then I want to take the S7. Because S7 now has null values and an infinity value. And let's see what happens. This is going to be interesting because I want to see what it does with infinity. And we end up with a median of 6, maximum of 27, 
and minimum of zero, which is correct, it drops those values. So when it gets to there and it ha doesn't know what to do with them, it just drops those values and then it computes it on the remaining data on there. So that's important to know when you're making these computations, you're looking at min and max and median, you're not going to know that there's null values unless you double check your data for the null values. That's a very important thing to note on there. So just a real quick review on there. We've done our created our PD series and we've gone ahead and done addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. All of those are three letters, so sub, min, div, add. And then we looked at median, maximum, and minimum. So we're going to go ahead and jump into the next big topic, which is to create a data frame. So now we're going to go from series and we're going to create a number of series and bundle them together to make a data frame. There we go, cell type, markdown. And we go ahead and run that. So we have a nice title on there. It's always good to have a good title. All right, so our first data frame, we'll jump in with some stuff that looks a little complicated, but we'll break it down. First, I'm going to create some dates. And you know what? Let's just go ahead and do this. I want you to see what that looks like, what I'm creating here. I've created a series of dates, PD date range, and we're going to use these for the index. Okay, so when you look at this, you'll see that it's just, an, basically it comes out kind of like a basic Python list or a numpy array, however you want to look at it, with our different dates going down. And we've generated six of them. And it's going to have whatever time it is right now on, your, on the thing for the date for the time. That's that time stamp right there. And then you'll see we have 1119, 2008, 1120, 1119, and looking into the future there. So that's all this is, is generating a series of dates that we're going to use as our index. And this is a pandas command. So we have a date range, which is nice. That's one of the tools hidden in there in the pandas that you can use. And next we're going to use numpy to go ahead and generate some random numbers. In this case, we'll do the np.random.random in 6, 4. You can look at this as rows and columns as we move it into the pandas. And of course, you could reshape this if you had those backwards on your data. But we want the six to match the rows, and we have six periods, so our indexes should match along with the rows on there. And then, you know, before we do the next one, let's go ahead and just print out our numpy array so you can see what that looks like. And here we have it one, two, three, four by one, two, three, four, five, six. Four by six. So it's a nice little setup on there. And since working with data frames can be very visual, let's give our columns. We have four columns. And we're going to give them names, A, B, C, and D. So now we have columns on there also. And then let's put this all together in a data frame. And we can actually, you know what, let's do this. Since I did it with everything else, let's go ahead and do columns. And you can see there's our columns on there. And we'll go ahead and do df1 equals pandas dot data frame. And note that the D and the F are capitalized. Series, it was just the S, and I always highlight this because you don't know how many times these things get retyped when you forget what's capitalized on there. It's a minor thing. You'll pick it up right away if you do a lot of it. And the first thing we want to do is we want to go ahead and take our numpy array, because that's what we're going to create our data frame off of, is the numpy array. And then we want our index equal to our dates. So there's our index in there. And then we also have columns equals columns. And then finally, let's see what that looks like. Now remember, we had all that different data that just looked like a jumble of data. We have our column names and everything else, our numpy array, kind of just a jumble array over there, 4 by 6 You could sort of read it. But look how nice this looks. I mean, this is, you come into a board meeting, you're working with your um, shareholders. This is pretty readable. This is, you know, this is our date. This is our A, B, C, D, whatever it is. Maybe each one of these dates has your uh, leads, closures, lost leads total dollar made, you know, whatever it is, if it's in a business. Maybe it's measurements on some scientific equipment, weather searching material, you know, where this is like a high of the temperature, low of the day, humidity of the day, whatever it is. So you can see that we can really create a nice clear chart, and it looks just like a spreadsheet. You know, we have our rows, and we have our columns, and we have our data in there. Now this one I use all the time. If we're going to create, we can create it like you saw here with our uh, numpy array. Very easy to do that and reshape it. You can also create it with a dictionary array. So here we have some data. And let me just go down a notch so you can see all the data on there. We have an animal, in this case, cat, cat, snake, dog, dog, cat, snake, cat, dog. We have the age, so we have an array of ages. We have the number of visits and the priority. Was it a high priority? Yes, no. And then we're going to take that. We're going to create some labels. 
we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. And what I want you to notice on this is we have a title, animal, and then we have basically a Python list. And these lists, they don't necessarily have to be equal because we can have non-data, you know, np.nan, numpy array, null value. But we want to go ahead and create labels that are equal to the number in the list. So A, the first cat, B, the second cat, C, the snake, D, the dog, and so on. So we'll go ahead and create our labels, which we're going to use as an index. And we'll call this df, let's do it this way. We'll call this df2 equals pd for pandas data frame. And then we have our data, just like we did before. And then we have our index equals labels. And if we're going to go from there, let's go ahead and print it out so we can see what that looks like, df2. So let's go ahead and run that. And another, again, you have a nice, very clean chart to look at. We've gone from this mess of data here to what looks like a very organized spreadsheet, very visual and easy to read. Animal age visits priority, and then A through J, cats and all your different animals, so on and so on. And then when you do programming, a lot of times it's important to know what the data types are. So we can simply do DF2 D types. And if we run that, we can see that our animal is an object because it's just a string but it comes in as an object age is a float 64 integer 64 and then priority again is just an object and exploring this this one's very popular let's go df2 head and if we print that out the df2 head returns the first five and we can change this you don't have to do five you might want to just look at the top two maybe you want to look at let's see well, let's do six so maybe we want to look at just the top six in the database, in your data frame. And you can actually, this creates another data frame. So I could have a df3 equal to df2, and this now takes the df2 and just the first six values. So if we do df3, run, get the same answer. And if we do it the head of the data, we can also do the tail. It's the same thing. df tail, you can look at the last... We'll just do the tell, which by default does five, the last five. And of course, you can just look at the last three of those real quick just to see what's at the end of the data. And this is I, the tell. I love doing the tell of one because I'll have like the index or something like that. And it will just show me the last, whatever the last entry was. You know, looking at stock values, and I might want to look at just the last five days of the stock values. I can do that with the data frame tell. And some other key things to look up are the index, so we can do df2.index. And I want you to notice that this isn't a call function. So if I put the brackets on the end, it'll give me an error because index is not callable, it's just an object in there. So we do df2.index, there's also columns. So we can go ahead and let's do, a, let's print this. Remember the first one's not gonna show unless I print it, and then df2 columns. So now we can see that we have our indexes, and we have our columns listed here, df2.columns, animal age visits priority. And it tells you what kind of object it is, or what kind of data type it is, and they're both object. And then finally, df2.values. And again, there's no brackets on the end of df2.values, because this is an actual object, it's not a callable function. So we'll go ahead and run that, and it creates, just displays a nice array. A very easy way to convert this back to a numpy array, basically. So before I go into the next section, let's just take a quick look at what we covered so far with the data frame. We came up here, we created our data frame, we did it from a numpy array first, setting the columns and the index. The index is setting it up is the same as when we set up the series, so that should look very familiar. So is the whole format, the numpy array, the index dates, and the columns, columns. And remember in our numpy array, we're looking at row, comma, column. So six rows, four columns is how that reads in the data frame. And we went ahead and also did that from a dictionary. In this case, animal was the column name with all the date data underneath that column. And then age with that data, visits that data, priority that data. And then, of course, we added our labels in there for our index. So there's no difference in there, but it automatically pulled the column names important to know when you're dealing with a data frame and importing a data frame this way. And then we did looking up D type. We looked at head and tail, looking at your data really quick. We also did index and columns and values. And note these don't have the brackets on the end. 
So the next thing we want to do is go ahead, since we're dealing with data science, is we want to go ahead and describe the data. So we have df2.describe to do that, and we're going to manipulate it in just a minute, but let's just see what this uh, generates. And you can see right here we have age and visits. So looking at our data from up above, let me just go all the way up here, animal age visits priority, and it does a nice job generating your age versus visits, which has all the data. You have your count, your means, your standard deviation, your minimum value, 25% are in this group, 50%, 75%, and your maximum value. So this should look familiar as a data science setup with your describe for a quick look at your um, data frame data. So let's start manipulating this data frame, moving stuff around, and we'll start with transposing. And it is simply capital T for transpose. And when we run that, it flips the columns and the indexes. So now the indexes are all column names, and the columns are all indexes. Animal age visits priority. So if we had come in here with our data shaped wrong, up above where we had a, a 4 by 6 we can quickly just swap it if we had it backwards. Not a big deal. And we can also sort our data, uh, something that you can't deal, which is more difficult to do with a lot of other packages. In the data frame, it's really easy to do, take our data frame DF2, and we're going to sort underscore values by equals age. And so when we run this, you'll see the default is ascending. So we have 0.52, 2.53 and everything else is organized. So if you look at your indexes, they've been moved around because each index it moves a whole row, not just the uh, one piece of data is not being sorted. So a very quick way to sort by age our different data in the data frame. And in addition to sorting it, we can also slice the data frame. So I could do DF2, and this should look familiar from earlier. We'll just do one to three. So we're going to pull out, whoops, it does help if I use the DF instead of just D. And we're going to pull up just between 1 and 3. So we have not 0, which is A. But we have B, which is 2, or B, which is 1, and C, which is 2. So 1, 2, and then it does not include 3, which is the standard in Python. And we can even do something like this. We can combine them, which is always fun. Because remember, this returns a data frame. So if I take df2.sort values, and we'll do by equals age. This is just kind of fun. And then I'm going to slice it. There we go. Double check my typing and run it. And now you should see FA because FA are now 1 and 2 on there. So you can very quickly create a whole string on here which narrows it, you know, that you can sort it, then slice it, and do all kinds of fun things with your data frame. We'll just go back to the original one. Run. There we go. And if we can slice it by row, we can also query the data frame. So we can do DF2. And this is a little different because I'm going to create an array within an array. And in this case, we're going to look at, oh, let's do um, age, comma, visits. So look at the different format in here. We have 1 to 3. So we've done this by um, slicing by an integer value. And then on here, I've done df2 age, comma, visits in an array. And when I run this, you can see that we get just these two columns on here. We get age and visits. So it's a quick way to select just two columns or select number of columns you're working with. And if you saw up there, we did the slicing. Almost identical to slice is I location, which uses the integer location 1, 3. There's a push in pandas to move to this particular setup instead of doing just a regular slice. And that's because this can be confusing when we slice 1 to 3 and then we select age and visits. So there is a push to go ahead and move to an I location, which does the same thing. You can see here BC, it's the same as up above. There's also a copy command, so we can do DF3 equals DF2 copy. We're just going to create a straight copy of it. And of course, if we do DF3, it'll be the same as a DF2 on there. So df3 equals df2.copy. And then let's do df3.isNull. So we're looking for null values. And this will return a nice map, and you'll see that everything is false, except when you go up here under the cat or h, they had a null there. And so if we go to have a couple up here also underneath of, let's see, the dog. Okay, there's a bunch of nulls in here. There's d up here. So let's look at d down here, and you'll see false, true. There it is. There's our null value. 
So we can create a quick chart of null values. You can use this to do other things. We can leverage that null value to maybe take an average or something and fill those null spaces with data. And we can also modify the location. So here's our DF3 location. And notice this is location, not I location. I location has I for integer. Location uses the, in this case, the variables on the left. And what we can do on here, and we'll go ahead and just set this equal to 1, 5, and then let's um, I'll pick a spot. Let's go back up here where we had, let's do F, age, just, let's see, what were we looking at? Oh, here we go. Let's do F and age. And up here, F is set to age of 2.0. And we find out that that's incorrect data. So we go ahead and switch the DF3 equal. And then we go ahead and print out our DF3. And if we go to F and age, it is now 1.5. So we're just changing the value in the DF3. And this is changing the actual data frame. Remember, a lot of our stuff, we do a slice. And uh, like it returns another data frame. This changes the actual data frame and that value in the data frame. So we've covered uh, location and I location is null. Making a copy, here's our I location, which is equivalent of a slice, and also selecting columns. So now we want to dive, just to take a little detour here, and let's look at T DF3 means. And this is kind of nice because you can do this, you can either do this by, as you can select a single column here, by the way, you can just add the column selection right here like we did before. So we could have age. Look up the mean, that just creates a series. If I run that, there's our age. But if I take that out, instead of selecting it, we can do the whole setup, and it has age and visits. So why doesn't it have priority or animal? Well, those are not integers, so it's really hard. <laughs> They're non-numerical values, so what is the average? I guess you could do a histogram, which uh, probably we'll look at that later on. But the only two things we can really look at is age and visits, and we have the average or the mean on the age is 3.375 and the mean on visits is 1.9. And uh, let's do DF3 visits. We'll go ahead and steal the visits again. And you remember all those different functions we looked at for a series. Well, we can do those here. We can do the sum. So if we run that, we'll see that these sum up to 19. We could also look up minimum. If you remember that from before, the minimum is 1 max. So all that functionality is here. I'll just go back to summing it up and adding it all together. So real quick, we've uh, shown you how to take the series operations and put them into the data frame. And then we can actually, this is an interesting one, we can just do df3 sum run and uh, you'll see the different summations on there. It just combines them. I like the way it just combines the strings on there for priority and animal. We've looked at is null We've also looked at copying, along with the different slices which we talked about earlier. So let's talk about strings. Let's dive into the string setup on there. And let's go ahead and create a string series. String equals PD series. And we just put it right in there. We have A, C, D, A, A, B, A, C, A. Popped in a null value. Cow and owl. I don't know why they picked cow and owl in the background. Someone must like those animals. And of course we can just do string. If we run that, you'll see leave the R out, we'll get an error. But if we put it in there, you'll see that we have a simple series. 0A, 1C, 2D, and it automatically indexes it 0 to 8. And then we can go string.lower. So when we're talking about our data frame, in this case, or our data series string, in this case, we use the string function, str, and we're going to make it lower. And if we go ahead and put the brackets on there, and you'll see that we've gone from capital A, capital C, so on, to ABC and BACA, CBA, COW, AL, they were all lowercase already. And of course, if you want to go lower, you can also do upper. And we'll go ahead and run that. And you can see we now have ACD, AAA, BACA. Everything's capitalized except for the null value, which is still null. All right, so we looked at a few basic string. You can see that string functions upper and lower. We're going to jump into a very important topic. I'm even going to give it its own header on here because it's such an important topic. What do you do with missing values? Panda has some great tools for that, so we'll dive into those. We'll call, we'll work with DF4, and if you remember the DF copy from above, we're just going to make a copy of DF3. And let's just take a quick look at the data we're working with. Oops, DF3, forgot the 3 on there. There we go. 
So here we have our cats, snakes, and dogs. Hopefully not all in the same container, because that would be just probably mean to all of them. So we made a copy. We're going to be working with DF4. And the reason we made a copy is we want to go ahead and fill the data. And we just simply do fill in A, and then we're going to give it the value we want to put in there. We'll give it the value 4. So I can run in here, and you'll see now that DF4 now has where the NA was. It's filled with the value of 4. Same thing down here. A lot of times we'll compute the mean first. So I might do a mean age equals df4, and then we want to go ahead and do age and dot mean. And then I'll do something like this df4. I only want to select the age, and I want to fill that with the mean age. And I run in there, and you'll see that. Our df4 age now has the means in there. Just a quick way of showing you how you can combine these. Let me go back to our original one. There we go. And run that. And keeping with good practices, df5 equals df3.copy. And then we'll print our df5, which should be the original one. And then on the df5, we can now drop our missing data. I'm going to simply drop in A, and we're going to use how equals any. So I'm going to drop any row that has missing data in it. And you'll see we had D here with missing data and H. And then let's go ahead and see what DF5 looks like when we do that. There we go. And there it is. D is gone, and so is H. So we create a new data frame off of this, missing those values. Now, if you have a lot of data, dropping values is a good way to take care of it because you don't miss some data. If you have not a whole lot of data, you're working with like the IRIS data set or something like that or something small, you want to start trying to find a way to fill that data in so you don't lose your computational power of the data you got. So just a quick look at processing null values or missing values. You can fill them, usually with the means. Some people use medium or the mode. There's different ways you can fill it. One way is means. And we can also just drop those rows. Those are the two main things we do with missing data. Here we go. Uh, we're going to cover next. This is, I so love data frames for this. File operations. It saved me so much time because they have so many different tools for bringing data in and saving data. So when we're looking at the data frame file operations. It's really streamlined. I don't know how many times they'll go on to different data downloads and they'll have Panda Download Standard on there just because it's so widely used. So let's start with the most common file is a CSV. So we have DF3 to CSV or animal. And let me just show you the folder it's going into. Right now I have uh, some untitled, a few things in here, but nothing labeled animal. So we go ahead and run this. And this is now saved the animal to my hard drive. And you can now see the animal folder up here. And if I, uh, let's do edit with a notepad. Oh, let's open it up with just a regular notepad. There we go. Or WordPad. If I open that up, you can see it's comma separated. Our titles, they don't have an index on the categories on the top. And the index, comma, then all the different data is separated by commas. Standard CSV file on there. And if we're going to send it to CSV, and notice the format is dot two underscore CSV. And it's just the name of the file we're sending it to. You can also put the complete path. By default, it's going to go whatever the active directory this program's running on. That's why those other folders are in there. So we have our DF3 to CSV. And then if we're going to put it in there, we want to also get it back out. And we'll call this one DF underscore animal equals PD read underscore CSV. I always have to remember it's to underscore CSV and read underscore CSV. I always want to do like a capital in there and not the underscore. So we're going in here again, it's the Active Directory. So if I now do print out my DF animal, and let's just do the head. We only want to look at the first three lines. So if I go ahead and run this, we'll see the first three lines, and they should match up here what we saved to our CSV. So very easy to save and import from our CSV files on here. And it turns out DF3 also has a two Excel. They actually have a lot of different formats. But, you know, old school, Excel was real popular for so long, still is. We can go ahead and save it as animal.xlsx. We're going to call the sheet named sheet1. And then I can also do df, we'll call it animal2, animal2. 
to, and this one's going to come from, and the same format on here. There we go. So we still have our animal XLSX, the sheet one, that's where it's coming from. Index columns equals none. So we're not going to, we're going to suppress the indexing on the columns. NA values, and it'll, it'll just assign that it's zero on up on your indexes. So if it says index columns equals none, that's what it does. And then we've added null values because there's null values in here. And we want to just make sure that they're marked as NA. And we'll go ahead and just print out the animal, animal two, there we go. And let's run that. Let's make this, no, let's just do the whole thing. So we'll go ahead and run that. And it probably doesn't help that I completely forgot the read. So animal2 equals pd.read excel. There we go, excel. So now we go ahead and run it. And what we expect is happening here, we have the same data frame on here. And if I flick back to my folder, you can now see that we have the animal. One of these is an excel and one of these is a um, CSV on here. And so there's our two file types on there. And they have other formats. These are just the two most common ones used. And I don't know how many times I've had stuff from Excel I need to pull out. If you've ever played with Excel, it's a nightmare in the back end because of the way they do the indexing. So this just makes it quick and easy to pull in an Excel spreadsheet. So we looked at two different ways to bring data in and save it to files. We've looked at all kinds of different ways of manipulating our data set and slicing it and creating it for our data frame. Let's get in there for your visualization. Always the big thing at the end because one, it lets you check to see what you did, make sure it looks right. And then also, if you're going to show somebody else, it makes it very clear what's going on if they see something visual. So this is where a really important part of data science is. So let's go ahead and bring in our tools. We're going to do import numpy as np. We want to make sure we have our ambersign matplot library in line. This just lets Jupyter know that we're going to print it on this page. If you're using a different IDE, you don't really necessarily need that, but this does help it displays correctly in Jupyter Notebook. And if you remember for earlier, we could create a, uh, we're going to call it TS. We're going to create a pandas, which are cute, cuddly creatures versus a pandem, short for pandemonium. No. So we have TS equals PD series, and we're just going to create a random setup of 50. We'll do an index. We'll set it equal to the pandas date range today. Periods equals 50, so the 50 should match. And I want you to notice something here. I did not import the matplot library. Why? Because it's already in there. Pandas already has its built-in connection and interface with matplot library, so you don't have to import it. And we'll go ahead and do ts equals ts dot cumulative sum. We're going to do the cumulative sum. So a little reformatting there, and we'll go ahead and plot it. And let's take a look at what that looks like. So we have a nice graph here. We have the dates on the bottom. We've set this up so we have a nice range between, in this case, minus 4 to, looks like about 2 maybe, or 1, minus 4 and 1. So what we've done here, we plotted a basic series, just a single row of data. And we've set indexes on there. But we can also do the whole data frame on there. And let's see what that looks like. So first, let's go ahead and create the data frame. We have here random numbers, and we're going to do 50 by 4. And then we'll go ahead and create columns A, B, X, and Y, just because we can. Index is the ts.index on there, so we're going to use the same index as before, just to keep it nice and uniform. We've already generated the dates to go with it. And then we can do, just like we did with the series, we can also do with the data frame, df equals df cumulative sum. So we're going to sum the whole data frame. And then we'll do simply df plot. And let's put that in. And let's go ahead and run this. And look how easy and quick that was to generate a nice graph with all the different data on there. So we have our shared index. We have the shared columns. And then we have the different data from each one that we can easily look at and compare. So very quick way of displaying data. You can imagine if you were working in, oh, I think I mentioned stock earlier because I've been doing some analysis of stock lately. So you'd have your date down here, and then you would have stock A, stock B, stock XY, whatever it is. And you could put them all on one chart and see how they, what they look like next to each other. And this isn't too far off from what some of those graphs look like, and this is just randomly generated. So stock has a lot of randomness in it, which is one of the reasons I actually play with it for doing some of my models on, for testing them out. Now, there are a lot of features in Pandas. So we're going to show you one more thing on here. There's some of the things, like I didn't go too deep. We looked at the top two for importing data from a CSV and from an Excel spreadsheet. 
showed you how to quickly plot the data. There's more settings in there you can do. We're going to do one more thing down here, and this is kind of a fun one. Change this to a markdown and run that. So how would you remove repeated data using pandas? And this is where you have a data set that comes in, and maybe it's feeding from one location, and in, instead of noting that it's repeated the date, like, oh, let's go back to stocks. That's a good visual. We have the stocks from the 23rd, and it adds another row, and it's the same row. It's, it's importing the 23rd again and again. So now you have that data repeated three times, and you need to go back and figure out how to get rid of it. How do you track that down? So let's start by creating a quick database, or data frame, not a database. I keep saying database, it's a data frame. And we'll just make this data frame has, using our dictionary going in, this data frame only has one data series in it, which is fine. So if we do DF to print it out, you'll see A, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 4, 4, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on. And so how would you remove that? Well, there is a, a neat feature in data frames called Shift along with another feature that lets us select just certain information. And we'll go with the location function. Put that in brackets. Remember that from above, location. And then in the location, let me just spread this out a little bit so it's real easy to read. In fact, I'm going to go upscale on that since we're doing some a little bit more complicated here. What you can see on this, on the location, is I have dfa.shift. So this is going to shift up one by default. You can actually change this to two or three. You can even do a minus one and it shifts the other way. But it's going to shift up by one by default. And it's going to say if that does not equal df of a, then we want that. And if you look down here, we had one, two, 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 two. When we run this logic on here and we do the shift, it now gets rid of all the duplicates. So we went from 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 4, 4, 5, whatever it was. Here it is, 1, 2, 2, 2, 4, 4, 4, 5, 5, 5, 6, 6, 6, to 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And you'll see on the index, it just deletes them out of there so the index stays the same. Obviously, you don't want the dates to change if you're working with an index data setup. So it just deletes those duplicates out of there. This is just a quick way to introduce you to, one, the fact that you can add logic gates into here. And two, the iLocation allows you to use shift. So there's the shift function, and then the iLocation selects that based on true or false. Wow, so we've actually covered a lot today in Pandas. We've really covered into the basics of selecting your different series out of your column, out of your uh, data frame, how to index rows, how to slice, how to plot. Hopefully you'll take this beyond that and start combining these different things and you can create long strings and really explore your data, generate some nice graphs. If you're in Jupyter Notebook, it's a great demo to show others. And I didn't know this about Jupyter Notebook. You can do this in Jupyter Notebook and then you can download. And I always, I never really look too closely at all the downloads. But you can download it as an HTML and post it to your blog. So it's got a neat feature in there. But any of this is really powerful tool. All of this is really powerful tools for doing your data science. And with that, we have come to the end of this Pandas tutorial. I hope you guys must have got a good idea about Pandas in Python. If you still have any doubts related to any of the topics we have covered in this particular video, please feel free to drop them down in the comment section below and our experts will definitely answer them for you. Thank you so much for being here guys. Stay safe and keep coding.